This is Troy, I'm behind the camera. So we're live at the Hilton Guam Resort and Spa at the Guam Chamber of Commerce Gubernatorial Forum. The chamber has been taken over by politicians in this room. <laughs> it's just everywhere. You know, just sprinkled throughout the room of these businessmen are uh, people in politics. I'm guessing the gubernatorial camps sort of stack the decks for each other so that they can be clapping as loud as they can for their candidate. Uh, Ed Antelan, the chairman of the board, is up in the front, so it looks like we're going to start soon. Uh, and uh, I know that the governor, uh, Lulian Guerrero, and Governor Felix Camacho are both here. This is the battle of the governors. You have a two-term governor, Felix Camacho, uh, and seeking uh, her second term, Lulian Guerrero, battling it out for voters uh, to vote for them on November 8th. There's Governor Felix Camacho passing by with his assistant, Gus Affligui. Governor Lulian Guerrero passing right in front of him with the first gentleman, Jeff Cook. Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio in the front. I don't see Senator Tony Atta. Where is he? Do you see him? There. Oh, there, there's Senator Tony Atta. Uh, at the table with Juan Carlos Benitez, the chairman of the Republican Party of Guam. Do you see Tony Babauta here? I don't see Tony Babauta yet, at least. Oh, there's Crystal Pacos and Augustine. Always a pleasure to see her. Uh, Attorney General Levin Camacho is here with his wife, Jen. Yeah, Ginger Cruz is here, the chief strategist, Rory Respicio, the manager of the Lou and Josh campaign. Oh yeah, the politicians are all here. <laughs> and it looks like we're going to start soon. I'll stand by everybody. It looks like this uh, forum is going to get underway. I don't know how many questions there will be or what the format is. I'm guessing there's going to be a coin toss at some point to determine the order of an opening and closing statement sequence uh, and also of uh, the turns that they would take on the questions. Hey, John. See you there, real Joe Cruz, Boot Oscar Mike, Cecilio Aguero, Teresa Garcia, Mary Royster, Monica Devera, Norma Jean Rivera, Jacine St. Nicholas, Buenas to you all. Thank you for joining us on our live cast of the first gubernatorial forum of the general election season a battle of the governors, Governor Lulian Guerrero versus Governor Felix Camacho. You know, Attorney General Doug, um, uh, I'm sorry, Levin Camacho is here. I'm wondering if uh, Attorney General Doug Moylan is here. There's another battle. A lot of parallels here in the election, the general election season. You have a former governor challenging a current governor. You have a former attorney general challenging a current attorney general. And the former governor and former attorney general were in office at the same time. Very interesting. And here we go, we're starting. There's Ed Antelon, Chairman of the uh, Guam Chamber of Commerce. The special general membership meeting of the Guam Chamber of Commerce is now to order. And a sincere welcome to all of you. You know, it seems just like last week we were here uh, for uh, discussion, and we are again here today. I'm very impressed with the crowd here today, so I thank all of you who are coming. I think going forward, I'm going to recommend to the Board of Directors of the Guam Chamber to label every uh, general membership meeting a Google Tour debate so we can get all of you to attend. So thank you for coming. Special welcome and thanks to Governor Julio Guerrero and former Governor Felix Camacho for taking your time to join us today. There are some very important issues that we'd like to hear from both of you. 
I was very happy to see both of you walking in together, having a nice dialogue, so I will just get rid of and put aside my flag jacket that I bought from last week's uh, meeting. Anyhow, as today is a special meeting spe uh, specifically to allow the group of foreign candidates to present the platforms to the membership, there's no other item on the agenda, the agenda other than the discussion today. Just one note before we begin. We would like to maintain a certain decorum that is consistent with all the general membership meetings. We appreciate today's attendance, uh, attendees to understand in, uh, that we are all here because we want to hear from our Google Forum candidates. As such, we ask that we refrain from others from cheering, from clapping, from whooping, from hollering, so we can listen to the candidates as they respond to the moderator's questions. And we would like to get through it in a kindly uh, manner. So, without further delay, I would like to now call Director Ernie Galito, our moderator for today's forum, who will provide the forum format and rules for both the candidates and the audience.
To my right, Felix P. Camacho was the seventh governor of Guam from 2003 to 2011. He began his public service in 1988 as the deputy director of the public utility agencies of Guam and later appointed the director of the Civil Service Commission. He served as senator for six terms in the Guam legislature. Mr. Camacho has served as chairman of the Micronesian Chief Executive Summit and the Pacific Islands Development Bank and was an active member of the National Governors Association and the Western Governors Association. He is currently the owner of RIMA, a Guam-based consulting firm. Ladies and gentlemen, your candidates. So by order of the lottery, I'll pull up at random for questions for each candidate. And as I mentioned earlier, the first question. I think we need to begin with the uh, opening statement. I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> so the opening statement will be uh, first initiated by Felix Camacho. My brothers and sisters of the chamber, four years ago, the governor job candidates took this very stage before you make their case for your vote and support. It was a very different time than times we face today. And for those of you who might have a, different, a difficult time remembering, let me walk you back. Four years ago, a record number of new businesses were opening their doors and expanding. Unemployment was at an all-time low, and local families were returning from the mainland to fill them. New healthcare facilities were opening, and specialty services expanding. Public safety task forces were making a dent in crime and drugs. And on a weekly basis, we were deporting non-U.S. citizen criminals back to their homes, never to return. Statistics showed that crime was declining in numerous categories. The prison population even went down. High school graduation rates were up by 14%. The dropout rate was down by 46%. The inventory of affordable housing was increasing year after year. Household income was up by 18%, increasing the purchasing power. And in the 16 years prior, more land was given to land and more families than any other time in our history. Four short, years, four short years ago, the future of our island was bright. My opponent is presiding over the largest government budget in our island's history, over $1 billion. On top of this, more federal funding has been poured into our island than any other time in our island's history. Despite all this money, we went from a season of record number of businesses opening their doors to a record number of businesses closing their doors building new schools to an administration that cannot manage getting the new Simon Sanchez High School off the ground. Providing more land to the landless families than ever before is what we did to the governor's policy of taking land away from original landowners for a stagnant hospital plan. Rising from rising family and household income and purchasing power to a season where fathers and mothers are struggling just to keep the lights on and put food on the table. And today, four years later, drug addiction is on the rise. Crime is on the rise. And we wake up to news stories of our Manapur and veterans living out of their cars and tents, wondering, how did we ever get here? Where we are today is not due to a lack of money. It is due to a lack of leadership. In the last four years, without a seat at the table, the business community endured 71 executive orders with emergency declarations that still remain to this day, ordering you to close your business, telling you who could open their businesses and what time, how many customers could enter your business, who could and could not eat in your business, vaccinated versus unvaccinated, with military roadblocks restricting your ability to travel, and you were even ordered not to exercise outdoors. This was a clear overreach of, administrators, of administration, violating your constitutional rights. Your freedoms were taken away. And this is where we are four years later. It is not political rhetoric. It is a fact. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Camacho. Ms. Lou Thank you very much, um, Ernie. Thank you to the Chamber for this opportunity. When I attended this forum four years ago, my number one priority was getting our financial house in order because the government couldn't afford to do anything until we did. After eight years in office, my opponent recorded the largest GovGuam deficit ever, over half a billion dollars. He tripled our debt and drained our public coffers. And he handed the next generation $100 million in annual debt payments. 
When Josh and I took office, the general fund deficit stood at $84 million. We simply rolled up our sleeves, got to work, and we cut that deficit in half months before COVID. Through improved collections, holding the line on expenses, and ending court-ordered receiverships, we turned Guam around. The deficit is now gone, and for the first time in recent memory, we're paying vendors in 30 days, individual tax returns in four weeks, and we're putting real cash into our rainy day fund. But it wasn't easy. COVID brought the worst year for all economies since World War II. While Guam has always proven our economy can recover very strong after a crisis, not even the strongest economy in the world can recover human life. The, I've spoken to many family members who lost loved ones. I felt their pain and I will never forget them. But I know the actions I took were the right ones to protect your lives and the lives of those you love. Josh and I knew the toll this was taking. I'm a businesswoman too. So we pumped over $1.2 billion exactly to businesses and families to help everyone get through. Once most of us were vaccinated, we guided our island back to recovery. A recovery that is working. Look at Tuma, look at construction starts and new business licenses. Look at unemployment numbers. After rising to over 19% during COVID, unemployment is back down 5.1% as of March this year. That is a lower unemployment rate than all eight years under my opponent and it's still failing. Our financial house is strong. Our tourism rebound is far exceeding forecasts. Our people are getting trained and back to work. Now it's time to choose who will lead us into prosperity. I ask each of you, vote for Lou and Josh choose to keep Guam moving forward. Thank you very much for your opening statement, both candidates. As we mentioned earlier, the candidate who opens the, the, their opening statement will be the other candidate that will field the first question. And as I previously pulled the question, this is for you, um, Ms. Lulu and Burrow. So here's the question. Public Law 3654, mandates the hiring of law enforcement officers to increase our public safety annually. However, many believe Guam is not safe. First question, what is your position on this statement? Second question, what steps will your administration take to keep our neighborhoods, streets, and businesses safe? Public safety is a very a strong prior priority of our administration. Crime certainly, uh, is also present in our island. The way to secure the safety of our people is to put more police officers on the ground. That is why Josh and I raised the salaries the first time in decades for our law enforcement. We saw our law enforcement going to other higher, jo higher paying jobs and we saw attrition. We wanted to keep our public officers. We wanted to keep our public officers so that they can go out and protect businesses, protect homes, protect the schools. We also were very adamant that these police officers go into the villages, be present in the villages, and that our people will know their police officers in their villages. This is very important to deter crime. We also gave resources, Ernie. We gave them police cars. We gave them equipment that has been lacking for many years. Many years. Many, many years. Under also my opponent, my opponent's administration. Police officers were not respected. Police officers were not dignified. Services were not being allowed because my opponent has decided not to make that a priority for our people in Guam. Thank you very much. Mr. Camacho, you have 
two minutes. In my time as governor, we built a northern police station. We built a southern police station. We equipped, we hired, we promoted, we gave pay raises, we did everything we could. And the, P and the police department responded very well. She talks about the fact that they gave raises, not just to police officers, whatever she promised it was given to other safety officers. I always feel that the police officer who is on the street has a higher risk because on a daily basis they are out there in front of the people. They are out there dealing with every situation, be it domestic, be it commercial. Crime is on the rise. And there is so much fear in this community. You open the paper every single day, you can turn to the front page or the third page and you'll see a crime committed, be it violence, be it robbery, be it drug, drug addicted individuals, be it just randomness that's going out there. But we have provided for the police, for her to say that that didn't happen. Has she built any police station? Has she provided any, any equipment? They're running around in Mitsubishis. What kind of police cars are those? <laughs> Insufficient. You know, and, and only certain vendors are getting, you know, the, these, types of, uh, these types of vehicles. But safety is out there. I believe that we have to declare a state of emergency. If there's ever a state of emergency that needs to be declared, it is with the Guam Police Department and it is with public safety to fight crimes and to fight drugs. We have to get together a multi-agency approach towards this. And it's true, many police officers have been leaving for higher pay. They should receive premium pay above all other public safety officers because their lives are on the line every single day. Thank you. Ms. Leon Guerrero, your rebuttal. One minute, please. Yes, during my administration, we did open a police station right there in Sinahanya. Was and in Kabul? No, it was open during my administration. And so, we do are aware of the resources that our police officers need to do their jobs. We are opening a station also in Telefofo, the eastbound station, and that's to provide more services to the south. We also have increased police officers by 12%. The retirees are coming back because we created an innovative, creative idea to bring the retirees back so we can push out the police officers to do more work out and security and safety in the streets. So yes, my administration has made police law enforcement a great priority because when people don't feel safe at home, it's not the right thing to do. Thank you very much. I'd like to remind the candidates to allow the other speaker to complete their answer. And you can also use your time for rebuttal if allowed. So, Mr. Camacho, question number two, you'll be the first one to answer this. What are some areas that you believe can be reduced or eliminated from government auspices or control that will not have a bearing on the services of government of Guam provides? In my time, we reduced government employment by about a thousand employees by attrition, by retirement. In fact, we had to work and provide the funding that several agencies, be it autonomous or line agencies, were not able to provide the government share towards retirement to get them off the payroll and get them into retirement. But um, we also, at that time, recognized the need to take the Guam Telephone Authority, which was the last government publicly, privately or publicly owned utility in the United States and, and, and go private because we couldn't keep up with technology. We consolidated agencies. We brought about efficiencies. And right now, I, I believe that there are, there is a real need. We also, at that time, took, for example, the school lunch programs within DOE and privatized it. There are many opportunities when you look throughout the government of Guam where services can be better provided by the private sector. And it would be a, a, a wonderful opportunity to work with the members of the Chamber of Commerce to identify where are these services that can be better performed by the private sector that are currently under government operation. Private sector brings about efficiency, it brings about in investment, they have the, the creativity, they have the resources, they have the ability to bring in others. They don't have to deal with procurement. We need to find ways to improve procurement processes. We have to take a look at all the systems within government. Because the problems are not necessarily with the individual. It is the systems and the practices that have been put in place, be it by public law, 
or be it by administrative rule, but the efficiencies have to be brought for better service to be, to be provided by, to the business community and the people of Guam. There are many opportunities to privatize and even do public-private partnerships. Thank you. Ms. Leon Guerrero, your two-minute rebuttal. Can you repeat the question again? Yes. What are some of the areas that you believe can be reduced or eliminated from government control or auspices that will not have a bearing on the services that the government of Guam provides? Um, you know, I think it's more important to address efficiency of government in that, in that sense. And I'll tell you, our administration has improved the efficiency of government. We've improved tax collection to the point where we retired the deficit in two and a half years in a pandemic, and we created a, a uh, insurance, uh, un, uh, unemployment insurance during the pandemic that pushed out a lot of help to our people. We've streamlined processes. We have looked at automation. We've automated uh, FMS at the Port Authority with automated uh, driver's license, with automated single filing, so much so that tax returns are given back to our people within four weeks, and we did not even have to borrow money, like my opponent did, to pay the tax refunds. Four weeks of returning these monies that our people so much deserve. So our efficiencies are being improved. We are so efficient that containers out of the port now are coming out within record time so goods and services can go to our people and back to you as businesses to improve your organization, to improve your profitability, to improve your services to our community. Our services, our government services have improved in many fronts and in a pandemic we were able to save lives, and we were able to protect you, and we were able to end this pandemic in a very good uh, financial strength and economy. Thank you very much. Mr. Camacho, your one minute rebuttal. I think each of you that are, is a business that may be a developer, what is it you face with a lot of times when you want to build something or develop it? You're stuck with the building and operating permit, operating permits, or the building permits at uh, DPW. Occupancy permits happen. The delays are, are occurring every every single time. It, it, it slows down development. And we, if you're able to get through the building or the op, the operating permit or the building permits, you're waiting then for occupancy. Vandalism occurs. Destruction to your property. It slows down development and it, it delays the revenues that are able to come into the government. You talk about um, business licenses. How long does it take for you to get one? Driver's license. You, you need to make an appointment and wait, wait for months to get it. The efficiencies and the problems that are happening here in the government is that they're still operating under COVID-19 guidelines and restrictions. Why not open it up? We're at 99% vaccination rates already. Herd immunity has been long achieved. And so let's get off this fear thing and get into operating the government to serve the people of Guam and the business community. Thank you very much. The next question, pulled here randomly, will be addressed by Ms. Leon Guerrero. <clears throat> we recently read the extension of the public health emergency declaration is beyond the month of September. Considering that the pandemic has moved more to an endemic, and in recent months we've had well-attended and crowded events such as the Liberation Day Parade, Labor Day picnic in the primary election. What is the basis for the state of emergency? It's question number one. The second question, if re-elected, why would you continue the state of emergency? And if you would not, what timeline do you have to stop it? First of all, we are not in an endemic. We are still in a pandemic. We are still seeing increases in positive cases. We are still seeing people die. We are still seeing, hosp seeing hospital admissions. And so the benefit of uh, continuing this state of emergency is a benefit to the people of Guam. It would be able to 
for the governor to quickly respond to any kind of surges that can happen with this pandemic. It would quickly allow me to move personnel so that the people of Guam can have the necessary responses that they need to be safe and to be protected. It will also benefit us because there are federal dollars that continue to come to Guam in a state of emergency. It, it, uh, it is with the SNAP program. It is also the ability to pay our National Guard when they're on Title 32. And so there are benefits that we need to continue on as a result of the state of emergency. Again, we are not in an endemic, we are in a pandemic. And so this state of emergency will allow our administration to respond quickly to the needs and the crisis of our people should that occur as a result of a surge. Thank you. Mr. Camacho, your response. Here we are, two and a half, three years later, 2022. It all began in 2019. COVID-19, the great fear, the great spread, lockdowns, mask mandates, vaccination mandates, 71 executive orders, emergency de declaration, we're still here. The response has not been, maybe initially it may have been a public health response, but let's admit, the response has been a political response to this so-called pandemic, COVID-19. The emergency declaration, no governor has ever had it for this long. They have not included the Guam legislature in this. You did not have a seat at the table. It is simply a matter of them being able to circumvent the procurement process. And you have to wonder, as the Democrats like to say, never let a good crisis go to waste. Who has benefited from this? What vendors? Have you had a fair shake at offering services and goods to the people of Guam and to the government in response? I say no. Thank you very much. Ms. Leon Guerrero, your rebuttal. Absolutely. No governor has had to deal with the pandemic. No governor has had to watch their people die. No governor has had to hold the hand of a dying person because their loved one cannot be there. This is not a fear. This is an issue of health. This is an issue of safety. This is an issue of protection. This virus is very real, very real. And at the beginning of this virus, we, the whole world, did not know what to do with this virus. So I used science, data, advice. And by the way, I had an economic recovery team with me that were made up of chamber members, both from the Guam Chamber of Commerce and from the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce. Gita was part of that. So yes. I worked with the private sector because I know the importance and the impact it makes to you. Thank you very much. This next question will be fielded by Mr. Camacho. <clears throat> While improving education is the bedrock of any administration, and as a vital component, component of a thriving economy, improving the infrastructure of the schools play a massive role in the process. We have seen the dilapidated conditions of schools floating around throughout social media. It's also been years since any real movement has been made towards the construction of a new Simon Sensius High School. Is the improvement of the infrastructure in the schools and the construction of a new Simon Sensius High School a priority of your administration if you were to be elected? That's the question number one. The second question is, what measures would you take to ensure that these construction projects move forward? In my time, we built five new schools. She hasn't been able to get San Sanchez off the ground. We also worked on Tizen High School 
And that was a transitory uh, position where we moved JFK students there until JFK was built. We built DYA, built, put in new classrooms, temporary classrooms. And I recently was involved in the establishment of a, of a charter school, Career Tech, down in Agate. So education has been a big part of my, my push. The idea was, was to use Teton as a, as a transitory location. And each school, such as we did with Antalan Middle School, move the students out, place them there, fix the school, move them back out, next school, bring it in. We were able to, because of the debt limit, think outside the box. And we went with municipal lease for 20 years. I convinced the Department of Interior that I could use Section 30 money for brick and mortar. I said, let me put this into schools because, because that's where the money should come from. It also came from uh, the compact impact monies that were used because of the migration of many people coming here. So the creativity and what has to happen is, is critical. So the priority, yes, is that we do need to build Simon Sanchez High School. They recently had, they're about 99% design phase. They had to move the design because of these snails that they considered to be endangered and redesign it around that. There are many problems. They haven't even gotten the funding yet to build it. And so we have to use creativity. The municipal lease plan is one way to do it. And uh, we're going we're gonna to use those, those same formulas that have worked in the past and begin to fix every single school that is exist existing now build Simon Sanchez, and then work with DOE in their master plan of what schools need to, be, need to be built. What's happening right now, though, is interestingly, the classroom sizes and students are decreasing. There's something happening with the demographics. We need to take a look at that. Thank you, Mr. Kamaji, you. for your response. Sorry, you're in your question. Ms. Leo Monroe, please, your response, please. My opponent had eight years to build Simon Sanchez. I have three and a half so far and more and I am at the point of breaking ground by the end of this year. That's pretty quick for a new administration that's only had three years and two and a half years of that is spent on getting all our resources to save the lives of our people. Two and a half years we retired the deficit. Two and a half years, we paid tax refunds within four weeks. My opponent had eight years and he did nothing in those areas. Tax refunds were months before anybody could get their refund. Deficit, $500 million, half a billion dollars deficit. My opponent, sat back and did nothing, watched our people suffer because they didn't get their tax refunds back on time. He raided the coffers and he put our people in debt, major debt. I say I am going to build Simon Sanchez within the next four years. Thank you for your response. Mr. Camacho, one minute rebuttal. JFK High School, Ukuru High School, New League One Terrace, Atacao, Tijan High School, new classrooms, Department of Youth Affairs, all within my time. And that was the second term. So within one term of four years, that's how much we did. She can't get Simon Sanchez out there. She talks about not paying tax refunds. When I walked into office, Carl Gutierrez had left me a $225 million deficit in the general fund. Retirement bills hadn't been paid. Refunds hadn't been paid. These were long-standing problems that we had to deal with. And you know, the thing about me and my lieutenant governors is we didn't kick the can down the road. We took the problems head on and we resolved them. It was eventually that we had to go to the bond market and borrow $438 million. Yes, to pay the tax refunds. Yes, to pay retirement. Yes, to pay Lola Cola. We had to do that. But we had to overcome a lawsuit by the Attorney General before we could do that. And it was only my second term. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so this, this next question will be fielded by 
It is Leon Guerrero. The cost of living is a pressing issue. With the current state of our economy, inflation brings greater challenges to families who are living paycheck to paycheck. We are seeing people leave the island to relocate regularly. It separates families and it causes a brain drain on skilled workers. While relief programs are appreciated in a good measure to provide temporary relief, they are short-term solutions. Our question is, if re-elected, what will be your administration's long-term solution in addressing the rising cost of goods and services on island? Rising cost of goods and services, I think, could be um, traced back to the cost of uh, supplies, the cost of uh, construction, the cost of importing. One of the things that I have done with this cost of living concern, of course, during this pandemic, is pushed out over $2.2 billion to help our people during these times and during their struggles. We certainly also just recently passed a GPA credit so our people can have some monies uh, re reprieved so that they can use some monies for uh, their food on the table and for their gas. I also am working very closely with the um, eco economic diversification team to put in and diversify our economy. We're looking at some really good investors and investments coming to our island. We also are working very closely with uh, our public health services to provide child care reprieve for our people. So now, every parent can have $675 for their child care expenses. If you have two kids, you will have $1,300 for that. That puts a lot of cash in the cash flow of our people. Those monies from public health have been stagnant. Nothing has been moved from those monies and my opponent's eight years left it there on the table when now our people are benefiting from it because of our leadership and our creativity to push that can of help out to our people. Thank you very much. Mr. Camacho, two minute response please. Over two billion dollars and all you simply have to do is push money out. It's so interesting that her pet response is I'm going to give you more money. You see, what's happened is we have created, she has created a, a society now where people are dependent on big government. You comply with me, you listen to me, you give up your, favor, your, your freedoms, and I will give you money. I will take care of you. But when we talk about the cost of living, let's face it, we are an isolated island. Most of everything is imported. And with that, of course, the rising cost of fuel, the shipping costs are there. Every ship that comes into Guam, the all the expenses are front-loaded. We have nothing going out but empty containers. So if we can create an industry here that can produce something that is of export value as it leaves the island, monies can be made on the back end. Secondly, when you think about the Jones Act, who operates under that? Matson. When you think about the military support program, who handles that? APL. Do you know that APL brings in fuel into Guam in their tankers that is subsidized by the federal government for DOD, dependents, and the business. Guam is now a target of North Korea, of China. We have a target on our backs because of our military installations and the fact that we are paying our, our role in the defense of America. This is the tip of the spear, as they call it. Why can't the people also deserve, and why can't we make a case that if you can, if you can supplement the Department of Defense for their fuel costs and, and all their goods that come in that you can buy on the base exchange or, or, or commissary. Why are there two separate communities? Why is there discrimination? We should also be availed of having supplemental fuel cost reduced and thereby reducing the cost of fuel, of supplies coming in. If we can get more ships coming in, if we could dredge Apra Harbor, bring in larger ships, 
the um, economies of scale would allow them to bring in go uh, goods at a lower cost. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Leon Guerrero, you have one minute. My opponent uh, is giving you ideas that you may think is very creative, innovative ideas, but these are ideas that could be done in his eight years of administration, and he did not. He could have dredged Upper Harbor, but he did not. We are refurbishing Upper Harbor because we know the value of commerce. We know the value of making sure our goods and services come to us and out to you. And yes, I have pushed money out there. I pushed money to the businesses so they could keep their employees and operate and provide the services for our people. I push money to the struggling families out there so they could buy food and put food on the table. I push money out to nonprofit organizations so they can continue helping government move forward and continue its operations. That's not big government, that's a humane government. Thank you very much. Before we continue, I'd like to remind everybody, especially those who are on maybe online, this is the Guam Chamber of Commerce Special General Membership Meeting and the Gubernatorial Forum here hosted at the Hilton Guam Resort and Spa. So the next question will be fielded by Mr. Camacho. One of the hindrances with government contracting is procurement. Businesses believe that the process is difficult to navigate it's time consuming to complete some of the requirements, takes months to process, and effectively cuts out small business participation with encumbrance of bond insurance requirements. What would you do as your capacity as governor to address the procurement process to make it efficient and balanced, as well as provide more opportunities for small business? Well, procurement is one issue that my opponent has not had to worry about under an emergency declaration. She's been able to circumvent the procurement process and thereby um, give to vendors who she, cho who she chooses whatever business or service she wants. There has not been fairness um, that's been out there. You, many of you, have not been able to avail yourselves of, of, this, uh, of this situation and be able to properly bid for projects that are out there. It is true that the government of Guam procurement system is very, very complicated. In fact, many a time with large projects that go out there to many of the large businesses that would be interested in bidding, whenever there, when, whenever there are any deficiencies, they are then protested. It is then dragged out through a long process upon which the Attorney General or some other legal entity would then have to determine what would happen. That's exactly what happened at Simon Sanchez High School. It was, it, was, it was protested. And so DOE, GDOE decided, well, we'll handle pr the procurement of it, and we'll go out and, and have someone design it. So that's, that's what happened. It's now at 99% design. Now they've got to go out and rebid the thing. So you can see that through law that was passed by the Guam legislature, through rules and regulations that have been, have been established, we have built up a procurement system that is very complex, that is very difficult to navigate, and, um, and delays the, the progress of any projects going out there. We've had to do that many a time. And so we need to take a real look at what, what models or systems that are out there, whether it be federal or other state or local governments, that have it right and adjust and make changes in working with the legislature to bring about whatever legislative uh, changes are necessary through repeal of existing law, repeal and then reenactment of what will work taking a look at all the government rules and regulations that are there to ensure that if we can do it by executive order, if we can do it by administrative law, we can have that accomplished. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Leon Guerrero, your response? Again, my opponent had eight years to do what he just did. Now it's one eight, eight years or four years of the same thing. I don't think so. The Public Health Emergency Act, which gives me the authority to bypass rules and regulations, and procurement is included, was passed, and my opponent was a sponsor, and so was I. And so now I am taking advantage of this legislation 
to provide our people with the, with the security, the safety, the needs to protect them from a god-awful virus. And I did not just go out and say, hey, you, 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 I love you. Here's, uh, here's the money. I did not. I worked with the Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association because I knew at the beginning, when the virus was really ramping up, the Philippines was closing its doors, I was receiving hundreds of passengers, and I knew from science that I needed to isolate and quarantine these people because they could possibly be bringing the virus in. So I did it to protect our community. But I'll tell you this, I did it with the help of the Guam Hotel Restaurant Association, and I did it with advice from people. I had two days to set up a quarantine facility, and through the hard work of our employees, we did. We protected you from great exposure of this virus. Thank you. Mr. Camacho, one minute rebuttal. Our good governor said, to a certain audience you're speaking to, I can take your money. I can take your property. I can move people wherever I decide. You see, that is, it doesn't sound like a governor. It sounds like a person who was um, pretty much akin to a, a dictator, a socialist. You know, so she says that um, she's exercised her authority under executive or, or uh, emergency declaration to do what she needs to do and avoid procurement. Well then, let's do this. Let us do a forensic audit of the American res Rescue Plan, the roughly two plus billion dollars that were given to this territory, and determine who received these monies, where did the monies go, and, uh, and take a look at every single thing. I would really love to work with a public auditor. I would like to work with an independent auditor. I would like to work with federal agencies to see where did these monies go? Because again, their theme is don't let a good Thank chaotic you very much. system go away. Thank you. Okay, for the next question to be addressed by Ms. Leonardo. Okay. The Tourism Ministry and the Guam Visitors Bureau heavily promote Guam as an ideal destination. However, residents and visitors alike see another aspect of Guam. There's homelessness. Drugs and crime make the headlines. Public restrooms are locked or in disrepair. Unsightly trash and makeshift shanties located, located near high tourism spots, including beaches and shopping centers, are growing and hard to miss as you drive through our island. What is your take on this, and how will you and your administration address this issue? Tourism is one of our strongest uh, influence in our economy, and it needs to be protected. And absolutely, we are promoting Guam as a safe, pristine environment for rest and relaxation. And we continue to do that. We are working to, to um, beautify our island. We're working closely with our mayors to beautify their villages. We're getting rid of uh, abandoned vehicles. We're getting rid of trash. Our, our homelessness, unlike my opponents during his administration, where there were 1,400 homeless, our numbers now say 638. We have shelters that we have provided for our homeless. We meet with our group to provide the care for our homeless. Yes, it is a shame that we have homeless here in Guam. I grew up in a village and in a Guam where there were no homeless people because we took care of our family. Unfortunately, that's not the case now. And when I see the homeless, when I am walking Paseo and I see the homeless, and I meet with them, they do want to get a job. I directed them to our relief center. They're being helped. I meet with them out there in the community. 
Our administration works very hard. Lieutenant Governor Josh DiNorio, on a regular basis, meets with the Homeless Coalition. We are putting up shelters. We are providing them through the Relief Center. And we are very compassionate for our people. Thank you. Mr. Camacho, what is your response? For almost two years now, I've been working with a, an independent group, faith-based people, that have prepared meals on a Wednesday and a Saturday on a volunteer basis. On a Wednesday, we would feed roughly 30. On a Saturday, between Timuring, Tumon, Harmon, Derido, we would feed about 80. All volunteer. Our people are out there talking to them. And these people are homeless. They are hurting. They've got mental illnesses. Many of them are veterans. Many of them are drug addicted. Many of them have criminal records. Many of them are, are just suffering. They're depressed. They've been rejected by their families. No one will take them in. So they're out there. And they say, we have to commit crimes. We have to beg on the streets because we have no opportunity to get there. We've prayed with them. We've helped them. We've tried to get them IDs. You say, you've got to get your, your feet back on the ground. If you can change a person from the inside out, that'll change their whole perspective. You can give them hope. You can give them life. And yeah, with tourism, definitely. In my time, do you think we did not also remove abandoned vehicles and ship them off island? We certainly did that. What, what did they do over the last two and a half years? Did they clean our product? Did they clean our beaches? You go around and you see all the public facilities out there. It is in disre disrepair. She put this government on lockdown. They could have been out there when everybody was there, not doing their, you know, not, not stuck at home, not at work. They could have gone out. The government could have done that and cleaned this community up. But we have to work with the, with the, with the tourism industry. We have to work with improving our product. But we have to help our people that are out there begging on the streets. On every street corner you would go and you could see that. And look at the violence. Between them, they're fighting for territory. Who's going to sleep here in this building? Who's going to sleep there? Who has water? Who, who doesn't? There are real issues, social, economic issues out there. Our people are hurting. You've got to take the scales off your eyes. You've got to have to unplug your ears so they can hear the cry of the people. And with the scales removed, you can see their plight. Thank you. Ms. Leon Burrow, one minute response. Yes, we are very compassionate. Our administration has provided many help and services and programs out there for the vulnerable, for the disenfranchised, and for the marginalized people. We've pushed out food stamp. We've increased our Medicaid from 18 million to now $133 million. We're pushing out homes that they can live in. We're building or buying shelters for our homeless. We're beefing up our mental health. By the way, our receivership from mental health was lifted during our term. It was created or was placed under receivership during my opponent's time. Mental health was placed under receivership because they could not provide the services for our people. Thank you very much. Our next question will be fielded first by Mr. Camacho. Well, there are currently plans on the table to construct a new hospital. The reality is it will take years before any ribbon cutting ceremony takes place. In the meantime, GMH continues to be a vital healthcare facility for our people. If elected, would repairs at GMH be prioritized? Is improving the infrastructure at Guam Memorial Hospital a priority? And if you were if you were to be elected, what steps would you take to address these issues? In my time, after 25 years, we finally had the hospital, GMH accredited, after 25 years. In fact, Governor Luli Guerrero was on the board of directors, and I thank her for her participation. But we have lost that accreditation, and the situation at GMH is atrocious. There are roughly 1,300 employees right now, close to 100 beds. And she has plans to build up an eagle field, taking away land from original Chamorro landowners. 
The infrastructure is not in place. If you look at what's happening within GMH, all the ancillary services have been established through the decades. Pharmacy, radiology, labs, cancer centers, all the treatments, physical therapy, the doctors and other physicians and other healthcare professionals that live within a certain vicinity says so that anytime anything happens, they're within quick response. The infrastructure is in place. So instead of pursuing these plans right now that are far off and far-fetched, we need to take a look at what we have now and then establish a long-term plan for the future. But fix the maternity ward, fix OBGYN section, fix the cracked roofs, fix the mold-infested walls that are there, and look for opportunities to work with the private, with the private sector. You know, I've, I grew up there. My mother was a lab technician at the old GMH. That land was given by my, her, my, my mother's father, my brother, Frank D. Paris, as a memorial to the people who died in the war. And I asked him, why did you give that particular piece of land? He said, that's the crown jewel of all my properties, but I gave it so that they could enjoy the beautiful view of Tumon Bay. So let's not put that aside. Let us do what we can in the meantime to repair what is necessary using Army Corps of Engineers guidelines and spend the money. Take that 300 million that is sitting in the bank in Agadia and invest it wisely. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Leon Garo, your response please. That's exactly what I'm gonna do. Take the money and invest it in a new hospital. A Republican administration got accreditation. A Republican administration lost accreditation. When I took office, I commissioned the Army Corps of Engineers to take a really detailed assessment of the hospital. They brought in experts throughout the nation. And they said to me, Governor, you either can repair and renovate this current hospital at $763 million, or you can build a new hospital at $743 million. Now, businessmen, you know, that's a lot of money, but still, it was a no-brainer to me. So I decided to build a new hospital. And I went around with people, and my first priority was, let's put it in a place that's convenient for our people. Let's put it in a central place so the South doesn't have to go very, fat, very far to get to the hospital. And that's what we did. We identified Eagles Field. And it's not taking van away from the people. The landowners know I've met with them. They will never get this back unless there's major changes in federal law. The military offered me the place. I asked for 52 acres, they gave me 102 acres. And I'm gonna put a hospital, public health, mental health, a veterans clinic, and I'm gonna make it a very shining star for healthcare for our people, because it's gonna be a one-stop medical complex center for everyone. Mr. Camacho, one minute rebuttal. So where is the plan? I understand that uh, the government has hired consultants to take at every possible scenario, to take at every possible site. Where is that plan? Share it with the people of Guam and make your case. She says 743 is, is the cost. Does that include infrastructure? Right now, just to build the hospital itself, not counting the infrastructure that has to go into the ground, is a million dollars per bed. And that's the average in the United States of America. Imagine the cost to ship and bring. And while inflation is at 9%, you people know, you developers know, that every day that goes by, every month that goes by, every week that goes by, the cost of inflation is driving the cost of construction up. 743 is not an accurate figure. And so, with infrastructure cost, all the ancillary services that then would have to go and surround that place, it'll take decades to build it. But yes, so they want to build a hospital for the people near a proposed missile defense site? Very interesting. Thank you very much. This next question, this is for Ms. Leon Monroe. 
One of the constant concerns we keep hearing is the lack of efficiency in the government of Guam. It seems that many functions are either archaic or operating business as usual. What efficiency or updated means of conducting business will your administration bring to office to improve customer service for island residents and businesses alike? Thank you for that question. You know, it's been 16 years of Republican administration, and when I entered this administration, we're still doing manual processing. I think that's very disappointing. Republicans had 16 years to upgrade efficiency. I have, so far, three years and eight months. We've improved driver's license. By the way, driver's license you can get online also. Not months. We've improved vehicular registration, and I know this because I access vehicular registration through online. We've improved tax refunds processing. These are things that benefit everybody. They benefit you, they benefit our people. We've improved FMS at the Port Authority. This is gonna benefit you because you will get your goods and services at a more timely manner. We've improved FMS in our Department of Administration. We've improved FMS at our Department of Revenue and Taxation. Very key agency to the government, because this is where revenues are collected. Our tax collection has improved tremendously. Our cash flow is very strong. We have now $30 million in surplus, and like I said, we are now putting away for rainy day fund. That's the leadership of fiscal discipline and fiscal order, which we need to provide services to all of you, businesses alike, public, private sector, and nonprofit organizations. Thank you. Mr. Camacho? Efficiency in the government of Guam is, is always going to be a task for every single department, every single agency. You have to remember, we have uh, what, over 50, 60 different, different agencies out there right now, and every governor has done what they could to take technology and apply it. You know, we, we talk about efficiency in the government of Guam, no matter what the governor says, that where they did improvements here and improvements there. Every single one of you know out there that when you are going out to try and do something with the government of Guam, whatever respective agency, you come across the systemic problems of inefficiency and, and lack of service to a level that is deserving of our people of Guam. This is not to say that the employees are not doing their job, but if you think about what's happened over the two, last two and a half years, this government of Guam has been on a lockdown. The employees were told, you stay home. And they, they began, so, so the many services, the, the permitting services, the regulatory agencies that are out there have been put on hold. As I mentioned, they're still operating under COVID-19 guidelines. We've already at 99% vaccination rate. Herd immunity has already been reached. Why not remove this? Why are we still under this declared state of emergency when the rest of the United States is no longer there? How many of you have gone to fiestas? How many of you have gone to gatherings? How many of you have gone to concerts? People are gathering all over the place. And yes, maybe the COVID is still spreading, but it is commonplace now. And that the fear, the element is, is no longer there. So we need to get off this track of staying under the state of emergency re-employ full Gov Guam and uh, in, in, in getting them to go and perform their duties full time. Remove these COVID-19 restrictions, improve the efficiencies of government of Guam, use technology, and then serve the people of Guam. Thank you. Ms. Leah Guerrero, one minute rebuttal. I don't know what world my opponent is, but I'll tell you, essential services continued on. We continued on with our essential services. Construction continued on. Healthcare continued on. Law enforcement continued on. Fire continued on. So I don't know what world he is living in. And I'll tell you, Guam is open. It's not in a lockdown. You're going to restaurants. You're going to the movies. You're going to the parks. You don't have to wear your
your mask anymore. Why? Because in the last two and a half years, we worked hard to protect our community. And the 99% vaccination rate was because of all of you that cooperated and adhered to the mandates and the initiatives. So thank you for that. Thank you. Before we move on to our last question, I'd like to remind everybody, please stay for the closing remarks by each candidate. That was a note for me. <laughs> a reminder, huh? So, Mr. Camacho, last question. Sure. Every day we read the newspapers or watch the news. Violent crimes against people and property permeate the top stories. The cost of methamphetamine has dramatically reduced in recent years, indicating there is an abundance of supply on the island. If elected, what would you do to combat this drug issue plaguing our island? When my opponent took office, she dismantled the multitask agency Mandania task force. Statistics show that they were very effective in reducing the amount of drugs on the streets, coming into our island, capturing drug dealers, working with federal officials in the federal court and local court, and ensuring that they, they put a tremendous deterrent against drug abuse, against the sale of drug uh, drugs on our island and on our streets. And yes, the truth is that the price of meth is now well under $100. That's because there is an abundance, whether it's being produced locally but more than likely, it's being brought in. We have to understand that this drug issue is not just local, but the drug dealers here are tied in regionally and internationally. And it's coming in through our airport, it's coming in through our seaport. There has to be a, a definite approach in how we are going to tackle this. Because the people of Guam are suffering. While drug dealers are making a, a killing and, and, and uh, earning a lot of profit, our people are dying. How many of you have seen the lives of our young individuals completely ruined? Every single one of us has a family member or relative that is dealing with drug abuse. Every one of us has seen the violence that is out happening on the streets right now. And the thing about it too is what we've come to learn is that not only were our young, young individuals now getting involved in just alcohol abuse, but you tied it in with meth and it becomes violent. And we've seen the unforeseen consequences now manifesting here on this island. We must take this, we must reestablish law and order, we must do everything we can to fight crime and, and, and work with our federal authorities, not just local but federal. There is an opportunity here, behavioral science, dealing with those that are in prison too, locked in there, those that are at behavioral health science. There are many problems and we have to, we have to solve it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Leland Guerrero. I didn't hear anything of what he did for drug. I'll tell you what I did. I deputized law enforcement people so they can go to the post office every day, seven days, five days a week, to monitor and confiscate drugs that are coming in. Within the last three years, we confiscated 480 pounds of methamphetamine. I also, after decades of not having a detox unit, created a detox unit. Lo and behold, we knew and found that there had been money sitting in a federal grant account that could be used for detox during his administration. Why was it not done? I'll tell you why, because it takes a nurse who understands the health care, who understands the importance of prevention, who understands the importance of treatment, who understands the social and economic needs of that drug addict, who looks at drug addiction in a healthcare holistic perspective. That's what it took. A person in healthcare who knows about healthcare delivery system and who can move healthcare delivery system to truly deliver and 
address the needs and the struggles and the pain that families have to go through because of drugs in our island. That's what I did in three years while fighting a pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Camacho, your rebuttal. She's right. You have a nurse for a governor. But the reality of living on this island, I've lived on the streets, man. I know what's happening out there. The people I deal with on a daily basis and, and, and the people that are out there on the streets that deal with the real life issues of our people, that's the reality, not what she's pointing out. The hurt, the pain, the suffering, and the drug abuse that is out there is actually absolutely real. How many prisoners are up there right now that have not even been able to see their families in over two years? Where are the faith-based initiatives that are available to help? Because you can heal a person. If we think that we, all we're going to use are, are these common sense and, and typical government programs to resolve the issues, it takes more than that. It takes a holistic approach. It is going to require faith-based initiatives where we can bring in the power of our Lord to help change their lives. Thank you. Thank you both candidates. Thank you for answering our questions. And now I'd like to give opportunity for each of them to give their closing remarks, starting with Ms. Lee Moreno. Thank you very much, Ernie. In the world of investments, past performance is a strong indicator of future performance. So where should you invest your vote in November? My opponent's performance over eight years included the largest increase in government borrowing and debt, the highest number of homelessness, and the worst record on tourism in 30 years. And though we can't forget the past, together we are turning a new page. I have never been more confident in our ability to perform, to strengthen and grow Guam's future. I am confident, not simply because I am governor, but because of the determination and will of you, the people of Guam. I see it in every small business person who fought through the pandemic and stood by your employees. I see it in the strong return of tourism. Flights are already back at 50% from pre-COVID numbers. Restaurants are busting at the seams. $14 million in hotel upgrades are nearly done, and unemployment has recovered by to 5%, and it's still falling. I feel it in the need, in the new investments being made in broadband, in our march toward better health care for all, and in the strides we are making toward moving more and more services online. We will all rise with a strong economy that will boost our revenues and bring new jobs. I am ready to work harder for you, to expand the circle of opportunities for everyone, to realize the biggest infrastructure build in a generation, including a new hospital, to make our streets safer and repay the debt we owe for our veterans. Our future is bright, Please join Josh and I to move Guam forward, and I humbly, humbly ask for your vote. Thank you. Mr. Camacho, closing remarks. Thank you, Ernie. Thank you, Governor. When someone is given power and authority, their character is revealed. Lou, you have used your executive authority under a declared state of emergency to do whatever you want in issuing 71 executive orders and have governed like a dictator. The legislature had no role, the businesses had no say, and you did as you pleased. The unforeseen consequences of your decisions are now manifesting. It's all on you. You are responsible for all that has happened. You called the shots. You have overreached your authority. You have used fear as a weapon. You have demanded compliance, saying, do as I say, or you will suffer the consequences. Surrender your freedoms and citizen rights and I will give you money to survive. Big Gov Guam, using federal dollars given to us, will take care of you. You have created a situation where people are now dependent on government welfare. This is not good for our people. The great quit, the great resignation has taken place. 
Why work when one can stay home and get federal money for free? There's a huge labor shortage affecting our hotels, our restaurants and retail operations, and other businesses. Over $2 billion in federal dollars was given to Guam, but all the money in the world cannot buy the voters. They cannot buy their hearts and the minds of the people. They'll take the free money. Who wouldn't? But you cannot buy the votes to secure this election. Our people are not for sale. You brag about deficit el elimination and surplus with a $2 billion plus money given to us by the federal government, even Mickey Mouse could handle that. So how politically convenient it is for you to pave roads on this election year. You had two and a half years to do it when the roads were empty during lockdowns. You could have done it then, but you chose not to. Your response to the pandemic was no more than a political response than it was a, a public health response. Crime, fear, inflation, the high cost of living are hurting our people and you are blind to it and refuse to acknowledge it. So remove the scales from your eyes and unplug your ears and hear the cries of our people. You can't sugarcoat harm Thank and destruction. You, Thank you very much. There is a new season coming. The light is coming. Vote Camacho Ada. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the Chamber of Commerce, Thank you very much for your kind patience and decorum. Also, let's give a round of applause for both candidates. Thank you, everyone.